Hi, I'm Tarani Domer. I'm here with Adam Wooten. We're from DevCycle, the feature flag management platform that's built for developers with their experience in mind. So you can release faster, more often, and with confidence. Joining us today is Jason Berry, Senior Staff Software Engineer at Netlify, here to talk about some of the use cases uh, that they're using feature flags for, as well as the migration process of moving away from LaunchDarkly to DevCycle. Jason, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Yeah. So can you fill us in a little bit um, about like what your current role and responsibilities are? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I'm a front end engineer um, and I work on the Netlify dashboard uh, primarily um, and various front end uh, client side applications uh, for Netlify. Um, so I've worked a lot on collaborative deploy previews, which is like um, on, you know, every branch that you have has like a dedicated front end environment. And we overlay some UI that syncs back with uh, your Git provider. So you can invite the team, reviewers and such to leave comments. And that syncs back to your open GitHub, GitLab uh, pull requests. Um, so that's one of our front end properties. And then uh, also the main Netlify dashboard where teams can come in and uh, administer, configure their, their sites and their deploys and, and things like that. Um, and also the, the CLI, which is another client, um, for like, yeah, interacting with Netlify in a, uh, command line environment. Um, and we use, uh, feature flags, uh, pretty much throughout all of those. And it, it really helps us a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, so what does your tech stack look like? Yeah, so for uh, we're a uh, React shop, right? So we use a TypeScript uh, React Redux app. It's been around since the dawn of the company, so, since, so like 2014 era. Um, so it, it's yeah, quite a large repo, and we have about 15 or so front end front end engineers contributing uh, to it at any given day. Um, that, that's the that's the biggest uh, the core core project. Um, and also the biggest uh, user of front-end feature flags uh, at Netlify. Okay, so is that um, is that kind of like the makeup of your team structure? Kind of, yeah. So we have um, organizationally we uh, congregate into pods. That's kind of like the base unit, um, and, but pods are cross-functional teams. So um, you know you'll have not. Front end engineers, back end engineers, not just engineers, right? Designers, uh, technical writers, uh, PMs, things like that. All, all of those kind of organize into pods. Um, but then on more of a horizontal level, we have like a guild, uh, so to speak, which is just like everyone from every pod who has the same role. Or um, So like all the front end engineers uh, together are on the same guild, but touch many different pods. So, um, because, you know, the front end app is, uh, it's a shared repo, right? We have, uh, it's all of our pods coming together to implement, implement features. So we have to, uh, yeah, kind of work together and organize and communicate to, uh, to build that app. Gotcha. So you mentioned that you use feature flags frequently throughout this process. Are there a couple examples you could give us? Sure. I mean, primarily the one, uh, the one we use it most for is to uh, gate feature rollout. So uh, we're developing a new feature. Uh, you know, you don't want to necessarily release it in one giant PR, right? Because that is your reviewers will be upset with you that they're reviewing like, you know, thousand plus line pull request. And uh, it's just a lot easier to manage when you can ship to production in smaller bite sized chunks and you could, you know, ship 5% and roll it out to prod and, um, and you know, your, your, your users don't need to know about it, right? Because it's gated behind this feature flag. Uh, and that way too, you know, like, uh, you're not having to deal with huge merge conflicts, right? It's much easier to just ship smaller pieces and feature flags allow us to do that. Um, also controlling rollout, right? Like, let's say, uh, we have a new feature and, or, you know, maybe even a bug fix and we, we're not sure how it's going to be received, right? Is the bug fix going to work? Will users even use this feature, right? We can do a controlled roll, uh, rollout, um, 
like I think you call them like gradual, like a gradual rollout, um, which is like a percentage base. So for, you know, 10% of traffic, uh, you know, roll it out to those users. And then we slowly ramp it up as we monitor uh, the results. Um, and it's not just, you know, random per request. Uh, you do a really good job of mapping it to the user. So if someone falls within that bucket, they continue to receive that feature. Um, any, even if, you know, they command R, um, yeah, they're, they're forever in that bucket until we, we, uh, change it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. So I'm kind of curious cause each company kind of handles this differently, mm -hmm. but when you go about creating, like even the decision to create new flags, yeah. what does that look like from like an end to end process? Like who's involved, who helps, who decides, how are they organized? All of those details. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we do it. It's just up to the developer. Um, so it's it's, so anyone, it's really nice. Like anyone on the team. Yeah, the person implementing the feature, right? So so th that's what's really nice is that we don't need to ask like, hey, can I make this feature flag? Um, your model too of unlimited seats, like not not paying on a per seat basis uh for your pricing is was instrumental uh to us as well um so anyone on the team should feel uh uh capable of going in and making a feature flag for their particular needs so um yeah pretty much whenever someone wants to release something that is bigger than bigger than fits in one pull request um uh, or maybe uh there's a release that's timed with a certain marketing announcement and we want to make sure that it goes out at an exact date because you know we're we're announcing something at a conference and we want the attendees to be able to see it as soon as the announcement is made that can be released at the click of a button rather than merging something in waiting for the build to complete right and uh trying to time it that way so um yeah, just gating features behind like a one click and it's just instantly released is is a huge help. Um, and yeah, d developers on our team feel empowered to make those feature flags without needing to ask someone else for approval. Okay, awesome. Um, you already mentioned seat based <laughs> pricing. Yeah. But are there any other uh, like unique features of DevCycle that your team is currently using? Yeah, we use feature opt-in quite heavily. So we have an area in Netlify uh, called Netlify Labs. It's like a feature opt-in. I'm sure you've seen it on many SaaS products uh, where as a user, you can opt-in to receiving experimental features. So it's kind of like a pre-beta. If you want to see the latest and greatest uh, cutting edge stuff, uh, you can, as a user, go into Netlify Labs. It's in, it's in the uh, section in the Netlify dashboard and click, I want this one, I want this one turned on, this one turned off, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so before we kind of Frankenstein together a solution uh, using uh, LaunchDarkly with feature flags for feature flags. So it was a very meta, uh, frankly, confusing <laughs> implementation where we had a feature flag that would determine whether or not the labs entry would show up in labs. Right. And that would show the name of the feature, the description, right. Kind of like explaining to the user what this feature does. And then we had another one that would, that was actually controlling whether the feature was enabled. Right. So, it, and, and, uh, it was a frequent source of confusion, right? Be, our, our convention was just reuse the same flag name, but put a two at the end. And it was, everyone mixed up like, is this the feature that shows it in labs or is this the feature flag that actually controls whether or not the feature is enabled, right? So um, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was confusing for sure. But because you have first class citizen support for user feature opt-in, it's basically, we just flip a switch on an existing feature flag, right? We toggle like this Boolean and fill out like, here's the title, here's the description. And then anytime someone opts in, you have your uh, edge DB that handles whether or not that feature, sh th that user should receive that feature. Um, so uh, 
yeah, my, migrating to that let us delete a lot of code, which is really nice. It's always good to have a negative of PR with like negative yeah. <laughs> contributions. Oh, it's the best feeling. <laughs> <Your time. laughs> Only thing better than writing code is deleting code. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think you've painted a really good picture of like how your team kind of works together to, to use feature flags in a general sense. Um, moving on to like more the migration side of things when you've made the decision to uh, switch feature flag platforms. Um, when you, when your team made the decision to do that, what were you looking for in your next feature flag platform? Yeah, well, really the impetus for us to switch was saving cost. So, um, many feature flag platforms charged by the seat and, uh, and you didn't. And with our growing team, uh, we realized that we could save a lot of, of money by, um, it, I mean, we, we did some in our old, before we came, uh, to become dev cycle customers, we would have just a limited amount of seats. And then we had a dedicated Slack channel where people would ask, can you enable this feature, enable targeting for this feature for me? I need it for this user and this ID and blah, blah, blah. And we, we had a dedicated Slack channel just for that because we, we, our budget didn't allow for every single person to have a, a seat. Um, so when we learned that, that your pricing model doesn't charge for a seat, it was kind of a no brainer. Um, and then uh, you've, you've also been really well at listening to our feature requests. Uh, you didn't have every feature feature parity out of the gate, uh, one of which was like uh, SDK support, but now that's landed. So where you can specify which SDKs you want a certain feature for. Um, that was pretty big for us too, because we share feature flags between front end and back end. And uh, we didn't want like the names of back end feature flags to be pulled into our front end, right? Um, it, that, that could leak feature details and things like that. Um, so being, being able to control which, uh, SDK a feature is enabled to while still being able to share flags between front end, front end and back end, or like cross SDK, uh, was really cool. Um, so a lot of the things with like feature flags, I mean, it's, some of it is kind of like Boolean in nature, like it either works or it doesn't. And then there's, there's also the performance factor too. So you've done a really good job at like eking out making it like super performant. I know especially uh, in the Go SDK and like our runtime folks are, are very happy with uh, uh, the performance improvements. Uh, um, and um, and yeah, so so really, yeah, it was the, the impetus was the, the pricing model. And then, uh, yeah, we, we came for the pricing and stayed for the feature parity. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Did you at any point consider an in-house solution? We did, yeah. So um, not just building an in-house solution for us to use, but that we would eventually like productize and and sell, right? Because we are a front-end platform. So uh, it's such a frequent use case, right? Of developers needing to control feature rollout. And we're like, what if we, you know, build this ourselves, not just to use, but to, to sell as well and bake into our platform. But it's such a large overhead and we didn't think like, like we didn't want to spend our resources, um, kind of building that one competing in a bit of a saturated market. There are lots of good players in the space that, that do it well. Um, and then two, like there's, there's so many things that we could be building and, uh, that like, yeah, it didn't necessarily make sense for us to build it when there's so many good options out there in the market. Fair. Um, what was your uh, role in the migration project overall? Yeah, so I led the migration for the Netlify UI. Um, so uh, yeah, I was responsible for the front end portion of the migration. Um, so yeah, that was the, our biggest web property. Um, we have others, of course, that uh, some, some don't use feature flags at all. Like our docs, I don't think use feature flags. Um, but then yeah, collaborative, co collaborative deploy previews that uses them as well, but it's, uh, much smaller. I think we have like two or three or something like that. 
um, but we have a couple hundred in, in, in our main Netlify dashboard. Okay. Gotcha. So, uh, migration is not a trivial thing. <laughs> so really curious to gain some insight into, um, all the major steps like involved in that transition and how sure. you tackled it as a team. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we, we had a pretty cool, uh, migration strategy and you were very helpful too. Um, I mean, you, yeah, you have a tool called feature importer, uh, that's open source and on your GitHub that we use. And that got us like 90% of the way there. So that was great. Um, basically you set, you select a project and launch darkly, and then it just migrates and like downloads it, converts it in the right shape. And then, uh, posts it to your API so that you see all the feature flags with all the targeting rules and everything like that for all the environments, uh, the audiences and everything, it's all replicated. Uh, yeah, LaunchDarkly calls them something else, but like basically just converting them into your world and nomenclature. Um, so that was a big help. But then from the coding side, we actually had a pretty good strategy that, uh, that I liked. So uh, the first thing we did was stop importing directly from LaunchDarkly. So we created like our own hook uh, that was genericized to work with either LaunchDarkly or DevCycle, right? So basically grep for every like literal import of directly from the LD SDK and create our own helper hook uh, that we called use flag um, and also use flags. Cause I think that had a more direct parity with LaunchDarkly of like you import all the flags at once and then you select which ones you want there. But uh, I like your method better because you can, you can set a default, uh, per flag. So if dev cycle goes down for any reason, right. Then the, the fallback is in the code, right? The fallback. So you say, you know, use flag flag name, and then you provide the default value, uh, because so some of our feature flags are defaulted to true, right? We want users to be able to like opt out for example, um, that was one of our use cases, right? So to, to have to define true in code um, was, was super helpful and kind of gave us peace of mind. Yeah, you know, for whatever reason, dev cycle goes down or something like that, then it, it resolves to sensible defaults. Uh, so that was really nice. So, um, so yeah, so basically the first step was uh, stop importing directly from launch darkly and have your like this, uh, our custom use flag hook. Then what we did uh, was we wrapped our app container in the DevCycle client, right? So we actually had DevCycle and LaunchDarkly clients running concurrently side by side. And the DevCycle one was the outermost. Um, I think it didn't actually matter which one was outermost. That was just how we did it. Um, but the cool thing was that we used a LaunchDarkly feature flag to control the rollout to DevCycle. So we used a feature flag to control which feature flag provider users used right and that was a huge help because it let us test internally um before before rolling out to a wider audience um and so yeah that we we actually built in a like in our command palette uh you could select internally we built a thing so you can select if you wanted to get your feature flags pulling from launch darkly or dev cycle and you just select it and then the page would refresh and then it would that's how you would choose your feature flag provider um and then the other big thing was swapping out our old convention i touched on this previous uh previously of like uh the feature flag for a feature flag for feature opt-in we didn't want to continue that pattern anymore uh, so this is probably where we spent the most custom work because your feature importer didn't know about our wacky, <laughs> wacky system. Uh, so we had to build something like it imported all of the rules, but we didn't want to use those flags anymore anyway. Right. So all of the feature flag two names that had all the targeting lists of, okay, here are all the users that have clicked into the, opted into this, which were like hundreds or even thousands of like individual email addresses on the flag. That was no good for us because we wanted to end up deleting those flags anyway. So I wrote a script to basically for all of those feature opt-in flags, point them to your edge DB instead. And uh, your docs were great in learning how to do that. Uh, basically just wrote a script that would pull uh, all the targeting rules for the individual email addresses 
and then uh, pointed that to the EdgeDB edge bucketing API. Um, so yeah, the, we had to do a custom solution there because you offer like a feature opt-in widget, uh, which is great. You can, you can set, uh, you know, your branding and colors and things like that. Um, and it happen, happens in an iframe, uh, but we wanted a more uh, custom and uh, more control of, of, over the UI um, and one that worked with across all our environments uh, as well, because we have local deploy previews, staging, production, uh, each of which we wanted to have their own like HDB environment. Um, so for example, you can opt into a feature in a deploy preview and test it out there, um, but it wouldn't opt you in on production, um, for example. So, so that, that was a bit complex because uh, we basically have to opt a user in, you use their, uh, we basically have a, a Lambda to control that. So we, we, we wrote equivalents of those launch darkly lambdas for a dev cycle lambda. And then on the client side, we would say, are you opted in to re receive the dev cycle provider? If so, hit this lambda, if not hit the old launch darkly lambda. But then that, that was tricky as well, because we had to be careful that that could create drift in in data right because if a user we want we were using launch darkly as the source of truth until everything was migrated over to dev cycle but if someone was already on dev cycle like someone internal and they opted into a feature if we ever switch them back to launch darkly it, we wouldn't have that that uh data right that they, they would they would have been opted in in dev cycle but not launch darkly so, so then we're kind of like forking user preferences. Uh, it, there's a bit of drift, drift. So that that was a risk. We considered uh, opting in would actually opt you in in both platforms, and opting out would opt you out in both platforms. But then that raised a question of, well, what if one request succeeds in one platform and fails in the other? Uh, what do we do? Uh, so we ended up um, basically just just hitting one and using uh, trying not to roll back users like once users were on dev cycle to keep them on dev cycle so that any of their user preferences uh would not be lost um so yeah that overall that was that was successful as a as a strategy uh we never had like to oh no it's not working let's put everyone back to launch darkly uh we never had to do that uh which was really nice um I guess like speaking of like PRs that delete code then so like your sort of feature and feature two setup sounds like it might've been a little bit complicated, but like the, 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 the sort of like simplified system of like sort of a first class opt-in thing allow you to like simplify the code around that as well. And like, um, delete a bunch totally. of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the labs component itself, like we were handing a lot of logic, just client side and yeah, the, the convention was naming convention was not great. It was, uh, we made a lot of accidents because of it, right? We didn't know. We thought that we had a flag enabled and it turned out that users couldn't see it, right? Because they could only see the entry in labs, right? Um, so having that first class support really cleared things up from a code perspective as well. Yeah, and I guess like also the channel you were talking about earlier, the one where people request changes to launch darkly, like uh, have you been able to archive that now? Archived, yeah, no longer, yeah. <laughs> It's great. We just log in with SSO and uh, yeah, make whatever changes we need. Nice. I feel like that must have been like a little bit of a celebration there, like finally archiving that channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, luckily, I I had a seat on both, so uh, so I never I never had to go through those pains, but a lot of my teammates did. Cool. So, what were um, and you talked about this a little bit already. But what were some of the tang like tangible differences that you experienced in your workflow after switching to DevCycle? Yeah, the biggest one was not having to use that channel for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, everything else has been really nice. I mean, um, yeah, you you listen to our our feature requests uh, really well. And, uh, I can just like kind of count, I feel like I can count on it. It works how I expect. I really like your model of, uh, like targeting users 
um, is like an ordered array rather than just a set, if that makes sense of so like, like the, your rule, the rule sets execute top down, like in your UI, you have like, okay, if, if this passes, then the user gets targeting. Otherwise they move on to this section. Otherwise they move on to this section. Otherwise they don't get the flag at all. Right. Whereas in launch darkly, it's kind of like, here's everything all at once. And you kind of have to see which evaluations, uh, supersede each other. Um, so I, I, I kind of like your, your method of your, like, um, your model of, of how users get targeted. So I'm kind of curious, just throwing mm -hmm. this one out there. Um, after going through this whole process, if you could redo something differently, like a lesson that you've learned along the way, what would it be? Good question. Um, yeah, we did have a, a minor leakage of backend feature flag names. And that was because we were replicating our um, our setup in Launch Darkly, but we had the oversight to we didn't notice that the SDK lineup wasn't there yet, right? Um, but you were really good, and you you actually built an off the sh like uh, uh, something special just for us, us, which was we were using like um, the tagging feature, so you can tag feature flags with an arbitrary string and all of our front end ones were tagged with UI. Uh, so you, you really helped us um, find a solution that would only, only the tags, only the flags tagged with UI would end up showing uh, with our SDK key. Uh, and that, that was like a stopgap solution until the actual SDK uh, uh, feature landed. Um, but yeah, I think that it was, it was a bit of a challenge because we wanted to use your projects feature, but then you couldn't really share flags between projects. Um, so we, we had a choice to make, right. Of like, do we want, do we want like the, only the feature flags delivered to the app, but then you couldn't share them across projects or should we, you, you have like the mega project uh, that is full of, of lots of feature flags, but then you can share them. Um, but that problem doesn't ex exist anymore because of the, the SDK import. So that's really nice. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of other, uh, other features that have been super helpful. I, I mean, I love, I love being able to, you know, click something in the dashboard and then see it update right away. Right. Um, like the, the their server sent events that just, uh, cause like components to remount, mount to remount, uh, rather than and, like users don't need to notice or refresh the page or anything like that. Nice. Okay. Sorry, um, Adam, you, I think you're going to ask a question. Yeah, yeah, it was just, it was about the previous thing, actually. Um, so you were sort of mentioning how um, you had the choice of uh, whether to sort of like separate the flags into different projects or try to like keep them all in one project. Um, and I, I think like the the thinking behind keeping them in one project is that you could theoretically have like flags that span multiple places in the application, right? Like maybe like a front end and back end feature that are like enabled at the same time. Um, is that something? that you guys are kind of like doing now? Um, or is it something you're planning to do in the future? It is, yeah. So so we we do it cross repo, right? So we have like a Rails monolith and then our uh, uh, React Redux front end. Um, and we're able to, to, we use like the front end flag naming convention that which is uh, obscured, right? Because like the, the front end flag names end up in the client and can be inspected, um, but then uh, the backend can use those same flags, right? So it really helps with rollout where you have a feature that's dependent on front end and back end things at the same time, you just flip one thing rather than needing to coordinate, uh, multiple. Um, so yeah, that, that's helpful. We use that, um, quite a bit. And you kind of like keep the same concept of like the user's identity across both places too. So that like, if you're rolling out or something, it's like consistent everywhere. Great question. Yeah. So, so on the front end, we target by email address because it's on the user level. 
And the back end, we actually target mostly by account, which is like the, your team. Mm -hmm. So we use your account ID. Um, and that helps us, you know, know what, what plan you're on, right? Because a user can be on many teams that have different plans, right? So uh, knowing like in what context your, the current team's ID is, and if targeting is enabled there. Um, so like in, in the feature flag, we have rule sets for both, right? It was like, does the email address match this and the team ID match this? Um, so, so yeah, be, being able to target both of those in the same flag is, is helpful. Okay. So, um, I guess last question is kind of just a summary of like the overall results that you saw having done the transfer. It sounds like a lot of deleting of things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah, I mean, yeah, deleting that we that hodgepodge solution we came up with before um, was really nice, right? Because we were kind of abusing the purpose of feature flags and like using flags to gate other flags and uh, using a feature flag for a feature opt-in that wasn't really supported on that platform. Um, that that was a pain to work with. So having having that first class solution was great feature opt-in. Um, and, and I love how we're able to still use our UI. To, so it has our like look and feel of our brand. Um, but behind the scenes, it's using uh, your edge DB, which is super fast and performant and is you can, we can, you know, create different uh, like buckets per environment uh, is super helpful too. Uh, and without saying we're sa saving a bunch of money, uh, which is helping our business uh, and everyone gets a seat, right? So we don't have to feel stingy about who is, who deserves a seat or who is lucky enough to get a seat. Uh, no more channel of permissions, asking people to toggle feature flags for them, right? That, that should just be something that everyone should be able to do. And now they can do that because we're on dev cycle. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming out and chatting with us today. It was really great learning about how you use feature flags and how you use DevCycle to manage your feature flags. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, yeah. No, thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah, happy customer over here. <laughs> awesome, Loved, love to see it. <laughs>